Thanks, Steve. And thanks, Corinne, uh, for having me. So like Steve said, my name's Katie. I'm the executive director at the Clark Historical Museum in Old Town. Um, we've been in our building since 1960 and house collections related to Humboldt County's history from pre-contact to today. Um, and over the course of working at the Clark, I've uh, been working there for about three years and then this last year as the director. Um, and I've done exhibits and all kinds of things and come across all kinds of crazy stories. So um, I want to share a couple of those with you today. So let's get started. Let me share my screen real quick. All right. So uh, within the last couple of months, there was a really interesting trend that went through on the internet. Um, on a website called TikTok. And that's a video website where you can share short videos, a minute or two long. Um, and there was a surprising revival of the sea shanty on this website. Um, and it made its way through um, all kinds of different websites as well, Facebook and all kinds of things. Um, and it ended up propelling a couple individuals to fame, including this guy. His name's Nathan Ellen, uh, Nathan Evans. He's from Scotland, and he was a postal worker who sings songs on the internet. Someone requested a sea shanty, and he sang this. It went viral over the internet. Millions of people viewed it, and he eventually became a uh, recording studio artist and is going to be having an album coming out soon. Um, and the song is called The Wellerman. It's very catchy. If you're looking for a song to get stuck in your head for the next five years, uh, it's a song to listen to. Um, and it's been covered and recovered by thousands of people since. Um, and now many other people are taking up the same song as a path to fame. So why am I bringing this up? It seems kind of random talking about local history, talking about a guy in the UK singing a sea shanty and becoming famous. Um, but the fame that Nathan achieved, um, many people call it going viral um, or doing these viral activities, um, things with high entertainment value that can be shared very quickly, um, isn't a strictly a 21st century phenomenon. Of course, through video it is, but going viral has a longer history. Um, so this is a short clip from the uh, 1920s um, of a famous pole sitter named Shipwreck Kelly. Uh, look at all these people that came out to see him uh, conduct his famous pole sitting. So it's literally a guy would be up on a pole for sometimes days at a time doing random activities. Like in this case, I think he's taking a shower on top of the pole. Um, and in this case, he is getting a haircut, it looks like. Um, but his arrival in various towns was published in local papers and uh, his travels were heavily documented in newspapers across the country. And you can still find those um, newspaper clippings today and people have done books and podcasts and things on this guy. Um, he's a really interesting guy, um, but he never traveled through Humboldt County as far as I know, but that doesn't mean other pole sitters haven't. Um, so let's go back a little bit further to a time uh, when going viral wasn't uh, documented in video. So we're doing the time warp. Um, and now we are in turn of the century Eureka. So in 1900, Eureka had a population of about 7,000 people. That's compared to today's 26,000. Uh, of course, many of the roads looked like this. This is old, a very famous picture of Old Town um, of people driving cattle right down the street there. But of course, the roads were dirt. They were quagmires in the rainy season. Horses were a major mode of transportation, as you can see here. Um, and things like logging and fishing were kind of the main gigs of the day. Um, and of course, in the summertime, people kept their eyes out on the newspaper to see what kind of summertime activities were coming up. Um, and of course, that was through the newspaper. So local papers at the time, uh, like the Humboldt Standard and the Humboldt Times frequently republished stories from other locations to give locals an idea 
what was going on outside the Redwood Curtain here. They'd also sometimes republish funny stories, kind of like this one. So the headline here says, thrashed by a lady cyclist who is noted for her athletic powers. Um, and it shows this uh, great drawing of a lady leaping off of her bicycle, punching a guy who happened to get in her way while she was trying to go somewhere. Um, these stories made individuals famous. Sometimes they would have a name attributed to the person. Other times it would just be very vague. In this case, a lady thrashing someone. Um, and uh, sometimes these stories, of course, would include upcoming events and famous people doing things like pole sitting. Um, and they would be shared through the newspaper. You know, people across the county would see them. Um, and they'd bring people to specific areas to spectate these exciting events at the time. Um, hot air ballooning was one of those big summertime attractions. So Hazel Keys was a, a lady balloonist. She traveled around, including through Humboldt County um, to ride balloons high up into the air and then descend, kind of like this picture here. This is of another balloonist uh, that came through the Fortuna area. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any pictures of Hazel herself jumping here in uh, Humboldt County. Um, but this is kind of how it would look. Um, so, whoops, sorry. So being a turn of the century endeavor, you could imagine how something like this uh, doesn't seem to be very safe. <laughs> um, you can see there's the balloon. There's no real kind of engine powering um, the balloon to go up into the air. Um, and there are recorded deaths of people who have ballooned here in Humboldt County and have died from a variety of things. Um, so I wanted to kind of give some more visuals to go with this ballooning trend. Um, but you can see here, um, this short little clip here. So this, this video covers about nine minutes, but I just pulled some clips um, to give you kind of the general idea. Um, so here we go. Okay, so here you can see kind of a group of guys and it'll zoom in just a little bit here. There's a fire in kind of a dish that they have going and that's generating the heat that's going to lift the balloon into the air. And they're throwing these hay bales off to the side into the fire to get more heat going. You can also see, um, let me play that one more time so you can see that part again. You can see there's ropes kind of off to the side here, along with one up near the top to kind of keep the balloon up right at least. But you can imagine how having a fire and people standing this close together and some uh, tarps might end up being pretty hazardous. Um, in Humboldt County here, the story goes that people would dig a hole and hold the balloon over it with the fire burning under it. Um, so here's the, whoops, come on, here we go. So here it is after the fire's been burning for quite a bit. You can see the balloon's mostly full. There's some ropes off to the side and some guys holding it to be sure it's not going to fly away prematurely, but here they go throwing some more hay in there. You can imagine once that balloon gets pretty full too, that uh, it becomes quite a struggle to keep it from flying away, especially if it's windy, um, which is a constant issue here on the North Coast. All right. There we go. All right, and here we are at the end. Um, the balloon's pretty much full. It's getting ready to fly away. Um, and people are starting to let go of their ropes. Uh, and there it goes, up, up, and away. And you can see it gets kind of blown about by the wind here. It looks like it's pretty calm in this particular clip. Um, and of course, check out all the people, like I said, going viral um, and everyone recording it on cameras and things like that. 
Um, so you could see how it's guided by the wind, particularly in Humboldt County, it gets windy here. Uh, these balloons could end up in things like redwood trees and it could become very dangerous. So these are some photos of some people out on the Arcata Plaza getting their balloon ready to fly. You can see down here, there's some dirt where they had dug a hole out um, that uh, rope to keep the balloon upright a little bit and then the balloon flying away. Um, so if this was Hazel's show, uh, the balloon flies up in the air, Hazel's holding on by a trapeze at the bottom. She doesn't have any safety harnesses or anything. She can't steer the balloon. She's just holding on to it. And she reaches a certain height and she leaps off and she has a parachute and she parachutes down to the ground. Um, and she actually ends up having someone with her, a very small companion. And, you know, they would land, there'd be a terrific applause at the whole performance. Um, and people would be very excited, not only about Hazel's uh, jump, but also her companion, who happened to be a monkey named Jenny Yan Yan. So this is a picture of Hazel and her companion, Jenny, um, with some of their ballooning equipment. And there's kind of a parachute there in the back. So this duo, or particularly Hazel, um, completed about 150 ballooning ascents in the 1890s. Um, it sounds like, though, uh, Hazel's show has kind of changed over time. So her first husband participated in part of it, and her second husband participated in some of her shows, and then eventually Jenny became a staple of um, the performance as well. So in March 17th, 1891, Keys and Jenny were scheduled to jump at the South Park racetrack here in Eureka um, in celebration of St. Patrick's Day, which of course is coming up. Um, however, weather and equipment didn't permit. Um, and the weather didn't permit enough where uh, there was actually a equipment failure and a young child almost died, um, a spectator, it sounds like. Um, and that's in the record from the Ferndale Enterprise um, so the jump was rescheduled to the next week. Um, and so Keys and Jenny jumped from only 800 feet. Um, the reasoning Keys gave was that if she had waited to jump off any higher, she wouldn't have made it to her landing spot. She would have gotten blown away. And you can see here, there's kind of some drawings of what their um, uh, parachuting rigs look like. So uh, you can imagine that they'd probably get blown away pretty easily and maybe end up somewhere they didn't want to be. Um, so the next week she was scheduled to jump again, but she got in an argument with someone that the newspaper described as her brother. Um, and that ended up derailing the performance. The balloon ended up flying away and uh, Hazel ended up getting booed out of town. Um, so that was... Uh, her experience ballooning here. Her last recorded ballooning jump was in 1896 in South Dakota. So papers would follow the travels of people like Hazel um, around the country. You know, they'd put, go ahead and publish advertising like this one um, to share with people and to get them excited about these performances that were coming to town. And sometimes there would be local groups that would pay for these performances. Um, other times the performers would show up, they'd pass the hat and would jump. And there are stories too of um, sometimes performers would come through, pass the hat. If there wasn't enough money, they'd kind of say, oh, well, we can't jump today. Maybe we'll jump tomorrow. And they would continue this on for weeks at a time or days at a time um, until finally they would uh, do their performance. So our next fun individual uh, is this guy. So he's shown here in two pictures in Sequoia Park. These are from the special collections at HSU. Uh, I came across them when someone posted them in the Humboldt County History Facebook group and was like, what's the story with this guy? And why is he in Sequoia Park with this crazy looking unicycle? Um, so he, uh, his full name is actually Cortland Edwards, but he is frequently referred to as Court Edwards. Uh, his father was Edward Edwards, which is kind of an interesting name. Uh, he was born in Topeka, Kansas in uh, 1876, and records show that he lived in this house, which is at 127 Cedar Street in Eureka, 
1903, and these photos were taken in 1907. And Court was 31 years old in these pictures, and he had just been married for about a year. Um, he and his wife owned a bicycle shop at 520 F Street in 1909. That's across the street from the Freemasons building, uh, right in Old Town. It's now a, I think, travel uh, agency shop. Um, and uh, in that same year, 1909, uh, Court took off on an adventure that lit up the local newspapers, but also brought him some fame from across the country as well. Um, he was going to unicycle on this rig here, uh, which weighed about 30 pounds, um, from uh, down to San Francisco, then over to Stockton, Sacramento, Reno, Ogden, uh, Omaha, and other cities, all the way out to New York, uh, which is quite a uh, ways to travel. Um, and of course, uh, so he was planning on going 30 to 40 miles a day, but could you imagine going 30 to 40 miles a day on a unicycle that weighs 30 pounds through roads like this, uh, with this you know precursor to AAA right here in the center, a horse pulling your rig out of the out of the mud? Um, and Court had a friend that was going to come with him. His friend was going to ride a regular old bicycle um, across the country and was going to stop in Ohio while Cortland continued on to New York. Um, however, uh, what happened to Court's wife is kind of a good question. Um, she did not want to go with Court uh, because it was going to require her to wear something called fleshlings, um, which is the Victorian version of leggings. And she was a proper Victorian lady. She was not going to be wearing no leggings and riding a unicycle across the country and performing along the way. You can see uh, Court had a coronet, which is a little kind of a mini trumpet that he was going to perform with going across the country to make some money along the way. Uh, Court's wife was not about that. In 1910, she ended up filing for divorce. This shows up in one of the local papers. Um, and she filed due to abandonment, um, due to that requirement that she wear fleshlings. She was not going to do it. Um, so she said that Court had abandoned her, which he kind of did. Um, and according to one story that I saw, um, Court's wife had also stated that he was going to take a different woman with him across the country, but I didn't see that anywhere else. So that might have been a weird typo or some hearsay, but who knows? Sometimes papers don't give you the full, full story. Um, so Court dropped off the radar for a while. It, you can imagine it would take quite a bit of time to get across the U.S. on a 30-pound unicycle. Um, but he was still on the radar of people at Bicycling World and Motorcycle Review. And this came out in, this quote came out in 1910, uh, mentioning uh, two other riders who it sounded like were also going to be doing a cross country ride um, and saying if they go far enough, they may meet the ghost of Court Edwards, the Californian who started a year or so ago to ride a unicycle to New York and who, with his bugle and his umbrella, not sure why they specifically mentioned an umbrella. Um, still may be on the road for all the world knows. There's also a really interesting one too, having to do with um, a guy who was dressed like a Native American and was also bicycling across the US. It was a very popular time to be doing that kind of thing, I guess. Um, so the next month, Court showed up uh, with a new rig in tow. Rather than one wheel, he had two. He was on a motorcycle. Um, it probably looked something like this one. Um, and uh, he, the story goes that when he had first started riding the motorcycle, he had hit a guardrail and ended up breaking a few ribs, yikes, um, but he continued on to New York, which is kind of incredible. Um, from there, he ended up going back to San Jose. He ended up in uh, Colorado for a time. Also, I think he owned a bike shop there, um, but then he had gone to San Jose and ended up becoming a motorcycle racer for the rest of his life. Um, but unfortunately, the rest of his life was not very long. He ended up dying two years later um, in 1912, which was a year before uh, motorcycle racing was banned because it was so dangerous. Um, these were the kinds of tracks that people were racing on. They were these wood board tracks. They could be banked as high as 45 degrees. 
And you can see uh, the spot for the spectators was up near the top. Uh, so you can imagine if something went wrong here, people could end up motorcycle and all in the crowd. Um, these bikes could also go 100 miles an hour. Uh, they didn't have brakes. And you can see their helmets here um, are mostly leather. So if you're going 100 miles an hour with a leather helmet, uh, you got to be really careful. <laughs> um, so here's a short clip of someone racing one of these motorcycles, present day, of course, um, on a wood track. Um, it's kind of fun to see how they start the motorcycles. You got to get a running start, and then you can kind of putt around a bit. And so whoever filmed this wanted to make it look old timey, so they did this kind of sepia overtone here. Um, but this is a present day video. So they're going kind of zipping around the track. This is a, you can see it's not as steep of a track as some of the other ones are, um, but it's kind of fun to see uh, these vehicles in motion. It looks like here that they're, well, maybe not that guy, but the other guy was racing in one of those more uh, historic uh, leather helmets. And there they are. So our last profile today is uh, the story of this guy who is here on the far right. Uh, his name is Edgar Lapointe, also sometimes spelled as Laplante. Newspapers sometimes aren't super consistent with spellings. Um, he was born in Rhode Island in 1888, and he uh, started his lifelong um, hobby, I would say, or profession even, of being a con man at the age of 14. He would go around and talk to businesses, ask them for money to donate to other businesses that were struggling at the time, but he wouldn't actually pass the money along. He would pocket it. Um, he was sent to boarding school to hopefully try and straighten him out. But a few years later, he ends up showing up in Coney Island and he's dressed as a Native American guy um, as one of their kind of sideshow attractions, which is kind of an interesting thing to do. Um, and this kind of began his lifelong uh, profession of being a Native American impersonator. Um, his persona shifted from kind of a more generic Native American to a uh, specific one, a guy named Tom Longboat, who is in the picture here on the right, um, who was an actual person. He uh, was a Iroquois and Canadian man. Um, he was a marathon runner who was very well known. And he was off fighting in World War I when uh, Edgar was pretending to be him in the States. <laughs> um, so uh, Laplante or Lapointe used his uh, persona as Longboat to host marathon running workshops and classes and things like that, speaking engagements. Um, but he ended up changing his persona again when Longboat found out that he was being impersonated um, when he had returned back from World War I. Um, so when uh, Edgar changed into his final persona. That persona became Chief White Elk. Um, and one of the stories I came across um, in another part of California was he and a sailor had gotten into a singing contest. Um, I honestly wonder if they were singing sea shanties. That would be a pretty uh, epic full circle. Um, but I think the article later on said that uh, the singing competition was a tie. And I think one of them ended up buying drinks for the whole bar. So, you know. <laughs> um, so as Chief White Elk, who's one of his studio portraits that he had taken, uh, he claimed he was a movie star, a war hero, a singer. He spoke 21 languages. And he dressed in this kind of outfit, these plains buckskins with a um, war bonnet headdress. Um, 
made of eagle feathers, but then other sources claim they were turkey feathers. Um, he first arrived in Humboldt County, and at least according to the newspapers in 1917, uh, he was selling Liberty Bonds at a rally in Holmes Flat in Southern Humboldt on uh, the great holiday of July 4th. He shows up in the Eureka newspapers in 1918, um, announcing that he and his wife had moved to the area and would be settling there. So here's a picture of them um, in the little article talk about them coming to settle in Eureka. Uh, it's interesting, one of the things here in the article says, Chief White Elk, who had three years medical college training, has been assisting in San Francisco with the influenza epidemic as a nurse and ambulance attendant. So he added that to his long list of qualifications. He went to medical school, according to him. Um, kind of interesting. So one other thing too is, so he would go and tour around selling Liberty Bonds, but I really wonder what ever happened if he did actually sell the Liberty Bonds or if it was one of his cons. Um, we're not really sure. We have pictures of him being at different events selling Liberty Bonds but don't really know. Um, so on the note of uh, LaPointe's wife here in this picture, um, she is actually a, a notable lady in herself. Um, she, her name is Bertha Thompson. Her mother, Lucy Thompson, wrote the book To the American Indian. This is a picture of Lucy here on the far right um, from the cover of that book. Um, and that is one of the few early contact period autobiographical, autobiographical pieces written by a local native woman. So it's a pretty incredible book in itself. Um, and when Bertha and LaPointe, who is still posing as Chief White Elk, um, the Cherokee Chief White Elk, um, they were married in Salt Lake City um, and their story made newspapers across the West for its extravagant um, layout of the wedding. Um, so it was a wedding featuring full military honors. Uh, 5,000 people showed up. There was a 31 piece band and 10 bridesmaids. Um, unfortunately, uh, Thompson and LaPlante didn't stay married. Um, within a couple of years, they ended up um, divorcing. And it actually wasn't until years later after LaPointe had died that Bertha found out that he was not a Cherokee, he was a con man. So that's pretty incredible um, that it lasted for that long. So he eventually skipped town. Um, he continued traveling around as Chief White Elk and later escapades included him going to Canada and Europe to raise money for different bogus causes here and there, and then skipping town when the gig was up. Um, and he married again. He tried to meet the Queen of England. He did end up meeting with Benito Mussolini um, under the pretense that LaPlante was the um, first and only American Indian fascist, which is an interesting title. Um, he was arrested in Italy and Switzerland. He eventually came back to the States. There's a story of him um, selling his gold teeth for cigarettes. And after a few more years of traveling around in different versions of this chief white elk persona, movie star, educated Indian kind of um, persona, he ended up having two heart attacks and he died at the age of 62 in 1944 in Phoenix, Arizona. So over all these years, uh, Eureka has been a crossroads of the West, attracting all kinds of uh, interesting individuals with um, interesting backstories as well, um, who shine brightly in the newspaper, sometimes for a long period, most of the times for a short period. Um, and they're, you know, on, on their way to pursue their next big thing. Um, these quirky characters, usually pursuing some sort of fame or fortune, might or might not have found what they were looking for, but either way, their stories end up forever enshrined in our local newspapers and as little gems waiting to be found by the curious researcher. Perhaps in the future, you know, digital researchers are gonna find our videos of sea shanties and other funny things on the internet. 
um, as these little gems of virtual archives and wondering why of all things a sea shanty, why of all things ballooning or unicycling or being a con man. I guess we'll have to wait and see. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, if you have any questions, I can go ahead and take those now, um, but thanks again. Thanks, Katie. Um, yeah, so if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll, um, you know, get, the, get them answered. Um, so Katie, the Clark Museum right now is open to the public, correct? Yep, 10 to four Wednesday through Sunday. All right, yeah, so it's, if you haven't been there, it's an amazing resource in the community. Um, it's always really fun to check it out. And, you know, while we're still in the red zone, hopefully we'll still be there for a while. You can go in and check it out until, <laughs> enjoy the, uh, the museum. Um, so we had a question, are there any newspaper sources from Eureka from the late 1800s that are archived online? Um, so I know from the library, um, we do have all of the um, local newspapers back to the 1800s on microfilm. Um, there is the California newspaper archive. Um, you can access that through our website. Um, and actually, let me see if I can find the link and I can put it in the chat window here. Um, that has a limited amount of archived, um, digitally archived newspapers, but it is a resource. Um, so let's see if I can get to that. Yeah, and with that particular archive too, what I found um, doing research on like uh, prohibition era type stuff is that because papers would pick up news stories from other areas, like I found a bunch of newspaper articles having to do with Eureka but published down in Healdsburg instead. So sometimes you might not get something from like the Humboldt Standard or the Humboldt Times, but you might get a story that was probably printed in one of those papers, but just printed down south um, if it was particularly notable. So I put the link in the chat window and um, you can get to it through the um, library website. It's humlib.org. And if you click on articles and databases on the left hand toolbar, um, that takes you to our page that has all kinds of our, our databases, um, including Heritage Quest, which is a new system that we just um, picked up, which is um, an offshoot of Ancestry and it lets you to do lots of um, historical research with your library card, like census records, um, marriage records, all kinds of really great stuff. Um, and further down on the page, you'll see the California newspaper archive. Um, any other questions? Oh, um, let's see, we've got one here. Um, to what extent was Eureka a stop on the national traveling acts like a circus sideshow or any sort of um, traveling performances? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's always kind of been a good stopover point going from San Francisco to Portland. And you still see that today too with musical acts. A lot of, a lot of them will make a stop here for performances. Um, and especially once you start getting into, um, you know, the still early 1900s, but past maybe 1910 or so, um, when you have the Redwood Highway is more developed, um, it makes it easier as kind of a stopping off point along that route. So. All right. Does anybody have any other questions? Oh, and actually on the on the topic of circuses, one another kind of fun story is, um, I don't know if you guys ever heard the story of the Humboldt Mastodon that was found um, up kind of by Prairie Creek area. Um, there was some road construction going on and the construction workers found some really large bones that looked like something like a mastodon. And uh, people got really excited. They said, oh my gosh, we found a mastodon in Humboldt County. This is really cool. Um, but later, out, later on, a story came out that there had been a traveling circus going along the route there. Um, and along the way, there was some road work going on. And one of the large you know, machinery type tools that was being used ended up getting stuck in the mud there. And so the circus stopped and said, hey, we have this elephant might be able to haul out um, this machinery that's stuck. Uh, but unfortunately, they overworked the elephant um, and it ended up dying from carbon monoxide poisoning, which was kind of a crazy turn of events. Um, so they ended up burying it on the side of the road, which is where the mastodon 
mastodon skeleton came from. Um, but before they did that, they ended up sending the skin to be taxidermy down to San Francisco. But unfortunately, it didn't make the trip very well and ended up coming back to Humboldt County and being buried near the elephant. Um, and the elephant was named Big Diamond. <laughs> um, so it's kind of a, an interesting sideshow story. Um, there used to be a plaque about it when you're driving up towards Prairie Creek where the Davison Road turnoff is. Um, there used to be a plaque there. There also used to be a restaurant, but um, so, <laughs> yeah. Another question, um, they're just asking, is there a reason why you began with the 1880s rather than first decades of history? Um, and uh, like Bret Hart in 1857 to 1860, um, was there a particular reason why you chose this time period? Um, not particularly. Um, it was just kind of uh, the stories that came up happened to be kind of around that time period. I, th I think that might be what you're asking. Um, uh, yeah. So I, th I think that answers your question, maybe. <laughs> if it doesn't, feel free to re-ask. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. And then somebody asked, um, you know, we had this originally scheduled till 4 o'clock. Not all of them go till four. We just kind of schedule that time period because um, some people have longer presentations, some have shorter. So it's kind of a, we just have that window of time to kind of block it out on people's schedules. So, um, but if you're interested in lecture, the historical lectures, um, we do have all of our past ones archived on our YouTube page. That's why we record this one. Um, so if you're in the mood for more, um, feel free to go over to our YouTube page. Um, you know, I'll put the link in the chat here and you can, um, go see some of the other really great presentations that we've had in the last couple months um, and that we'll continue to post on there. So. And on the topic of history presentations to the, um, the museum this last year had all of our, um, we, so we do a history symposium each year. Last year was our second year of doing it. And this 2021 was all uh, virtual because of the pandemic and everything. So we also have some videos up for different lectures and presentations and um, a couple of behind the scenes kind of tours of some local history organizations like Timber Heritage uh, was a really exciting one. Um, they have one of the trains start up and you can I end up hopping into it and riding around a little bit. Um, and there are other behind the scenes at the Historical Society and at the Eureka Theater, um, along with kind of some lecture style presentations. And those can be found on our website, clarkmuseum.org, um, or also our Facebook page. Okay, and I'll go ahead and put a link to that too. Um, Thanks. So you guys can click on it. There you go. Um, yeah, I, that's kind of one of the odd upsides of the last year of pandemic is, um, I know for the library, we've always wanted to do online programs and kind of push it off till, you know, oh, someday and someday and then someday came with a vengeance and we started putting everything online. So um, now there's a lot of great resources online that you can easily access from your home. So, you know, there's a bright spot to all of this. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, and if there are no other questions, um, I'll go ahead and let you all go for the day, try to enjoy some sun while we have it. Um, like I mentioned, or like Steve mentioned, next month um, we will have um, Mike Berry talking about the history of breweries in Humboldt County. So that should be a very fun topic. Um, and since you're already here, you're already signed up for um, to receive the invite. So you'll get the invite from me. Um, and if anything else comes up, if you have any questions um, with the library or anything like that, you have my email or you can just give us a call. Our number is 269-1915 and we're more than happy to help you out. Um, and with that, I'll let you go and I wish you all a happy weekend. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone.